Hi, welcome to another edition of Antique Radio Archaeology. Today we're going to be doing a product review on an RB3 Universal Battery Eliminator. Now anyone that has done any work on 1920s radios is very familiar with battery eliminators because obviously using batteries to power up these sets for any length of time and or while troubleshooting can be uh, a bit obnoxious because batteries tend to run out after a while it gets to be very costly so people are always looking for that uh, solution to that problem and that's by hooking up a battery eliminator to the AC mains and of course using the DC off the battery eliminator to supply the different battery voltages needed in the radio. On this particular video what I'm going to try and do is uh, talk a little bit about battery eliminators, uh, when they started and how they progressed. And then we're going to get into the company that makes this particular battery eliminator and then I'm going to try and wrap up uh, by hooking it up to a radio showing you how it can be configured and also to talk a little bit about the cost which seems to be an issue with uh, a lot of uh, collectors uh, as far as uh, going out and purchasing one of these and, um, and we'll go over the pluses and minuses there so let's go ahead and get started. Now as AC power started coming into the homes, a lot of uh, radio manufacturers were definitely looking into how they can use that instead of batteries in their radios. The Steinite Radio Company actually uh, kind of claims to be one of the first to have a commercially available AC powered radio, which they said it was powered by lamp sockets. Other than Steinite, a lot of other radio manufacturers were starting to look at uh, building power supplies that would supply DC voltages but also use AC voltages where they could. And tubes were starting to make that transition as well. So about the mid-20s to between 1925 and 1927 or so is when you started seeing AC radios make their appearance and also a lot of AC power supplies that were hooked to radios that would that could either be powered by batteries or by AC power. So here's an example of a late 20s, early 30s battery eliminator. Uh, this one's made by the Codell Radio Corporation uh, out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, this thing's in pretty bad shape. Transformers are burnt up in it. Uh, it's got a tar-filled capacitor pack. Wow, this thing's something that I've had sitting in the basement for a while. One of these days I'll try to do something with it. I haven't quite figured it out. But just wanted to kind of give you an idea of this boat anchor of a battery eliminator that existed back in those days. When houses went to AC power, it was obviously a desire to get out from under using batteries to power radios. And a lot of these battery eliminators were designed for specific radios or a specific uh, line of radios. So they only had the voltages available that that particular radio would need. So they were kind of limited uh, in its use. And also back then, I mean, we're not talking about collectors. We're talking about people that had radios in their houses. They would only have one radio that they would listen to, so they only needed one battery eliminator. Now, obviously, as people began collecting radios uh, that are now considered antique, uh, a lot of us antique radio restoration people like to deal with a lot of different variations of radios and therefore we need a lot more voltages than what were available in some of these old simple battery eliminators. Let's, um, if we fast forward to the 1980s, uh, obviously solid state has kicked in and a lot of um, radio restorers were building their own little power supplies or they're using bench supplies uh, to get their different voltages but there was definitely a need for a particular power supply to just work with the 1920s radios 
and that would involve voltages of A, B, and C batteries. A batteries being somewhere between one and a half volt and six volts. The B batteries being usually 22 volts to up to 180 volts. And C batteries could be anywhere from minus four and a half volts to minus 22 to minus 40 volts. So uh, it just depends on the particular radios. So antique radio people, being the DIYers that they were, would start building their own power supplies. And there were a lot of different variations of power supplies, some successful, some not so successful. Um, a lot of uh, trial and error, and uh, there really wasn't anything uh, significant out on the market. Antique electronic supply actually produced a kit and these are both built from that kit. This particular kit would supply B voltages of 22, 45, 67, 90 volts, 110 volts, and 135 volts. It also produced a C minus and C plus voltage, which was variable. And you had your A minus and A plus. So this would definitely power most 1920s radios. Now, unfortunately, the kit, uh, which was a, I thought was a relatively successful kit, it sold for about $70 or so, and unfortunately, it uh, kind of dropped out of their inventory. And uh, people are just, uh, you know, they were, I think a lot of people were upset that it went away, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Now, obviously, the big cost on a lot of these are going to be the transformers and the availability of these parts. Now, I think most of these parts are still available. And, you know, that's always an option. If you need a power supply, you can always build one. But, you got to think about costs. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. But, you know, the cost of, of building these things is not as cheap as you may think, especially if you don't have a big supply of parts laying around. So in the mid-1980s, there was a guy named David Snow who uh, was basically an antique radio enthusiast, collector. Uh, he got started when he was a kid uh, with his dad. And his first radio was an AK Cathedral radio that he came across and got interested in. When he was interviewed by a, a, a local newspaper, that came to his school, uh, he was asked what he wanted to be when he grew up, and he actually said he wanted to be a radio repairman. So he, he kind of wanted to follow in his dad's footsteps. Now, he joined the Navy as a radio operator later on, and he specialized in teletype, and then he went on to a career as an electrical engineer. While working on the 1920s radios, he realized there just weren't any commercially available power supplies out there. He decided to use his electrical engineering skills and come up with uh, a power supply of his own. And in 1987, he created the RB3. Now, it wasn't probably called the RB3 at that time, but he had built one for himself, and then he wound up building one for a friend, and then another friend, and maybe another friend, and... And then he realized, well, you know what, he might be onto something, so he decided to put it together and make a commercially viable product. So he created the RB3, which stands for Antique Radio Battery Eliminator, and the Roman numeral 3 stands for the three different power supplies that it uses. That was the beginning of his company. And he has gone on since 1987 to continue to produce these basically in his own little workshop by hand for many, many years. And he's produced probably close to, if not exceeding, 4,000 of them in that time. And it's just a small little American operation. It's not anything majorly competitive in a market that doesn't have... a uh, a huge draw for this type of product and he's producing them uh, pretty much to order so that is where the RB3 power supply came from I just acquired this one recently uh, this is really I, I really like it uh, now most of you probably don't 
recognize this particular case on it. You've probably just seen the, the little plastic case that, that this screws into. But this is a, a, a new case that he's just recently introduced that makes it look like a Burgess battery. So I just I thought that was really cool. Now it's an additional $50 for this. Now this particular uh, uh, power supply sells for about $160. This mod here is another $50 if you want to buy it. Now I know it may sound expensive to a lot of people but I just thought it was really cool and wanted to get it. Now I will say up front these things are just decorative. They are not usable so uh, just wanted to make that clear. There's nothing really on the website that says anything about it but uh, this is everything that it comes with. Uh, he has a little radio log which is kind of cool. has a little packet that has his business card in it and has a little tweaker here for adjusting the A power supply. You can adjust it between one and a half volts and, and uh, six volts. A couple of jumpers so that you can jumper the uh, power supplies when you need to. Let's say you need your C plus to go to your A minus or your uh, A plus to go to your B minus. That's what these are for. And, of course, he has a neat little owner's manual, which is very, very comprehensive for what you, you're getting. So it's definitely worth it to go through it. I really love the little uh, chart here that tells you about the different tubes and the voltages and the current draw so that you know how much you can hook up. Now, this thing, will, I mean, it has 60 milliamps of uh, current draw. Uh, total on the power supplies, which is more than most radios plus amplifiers uh, will take. So it, it's definitely uh, not something you need to worry too much about. But if you are getting into something that might have a strong current draw, you might want to kind of look over this chart and, and, and measure things out. Now, I will say that uh, one of the nice things about this particular unit is, and it says it right here, fully regulated, self-protecting, meaning if you do overdraw it, you're, it's going to shut down. It's, gonna, it's got a uh, thermal shutdown. It's not going to let you damage it and, and or your radio. So uh, that's really a nice option to have. Now, one of the best things about this is you have a five-year warranty on it. So that is not something you see too often in any product out on the market today. So just keep that in mind if you're looking for a power supply. But I really like this particular unit. And um, I've been really pleased with it since I picked it up. Now, I do use my other ones for whatever reasons. But uh, I, I have been using this a lot more as I get used to it. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at how we can hook this up to an actual radio. Okay, so here's the unit itself. Close up, and as you can see, I have my C voltages of minus four and a half, minus nine, minus 22. I've got my B voltages of 22, 45, 67, 90, and 135, and then I got my A plus, A minus, right here. When you power this on, one thing to keep in mind, this chassis right here, this plate, that is tied to your electrical ground, the third prong on the uh, power cord. So be very aware of that. You don't want leads touching this plate when you're playing around with it because you're going to short it to ground. So just be be very cautious and very aware of that. So and it's, it's a, a protection thing. So, so let's take a look at our B voltages. Let me go ahead and uh, set this up for volts DC. There's my 22 and a half volts, which is 22.45. There's my 45 volts, which is 44.9. 67 is 67.4. 90 is 89.99, almost 90. And then my 135 is 132.9, close enough. Now, my C voltages, obviously, are going to be 
minus 4.7 for minus 4.5. Minus 9.5 for my 9, and minus 23 for my minus 22, which is, that's fine for grid. Okay, for my A plus, A minus, as you can see, I'm reading a little bit low. Go ahead and pop this in there. There we go. There's six volts. Close enough. All right. So that's pretty much how you turn it on and set it up. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and hook this thing up. What I want to do is my... Got my jumpers between my C plus and my A minus and then I've got my A plus going over to my B minus so my two C voltages 4.5 and, and 22.5 and I'm going to hook them both to this minus 4.5 volts here okay that is my B plus 45 go ahead and hook that up here this is the third battery configuration, by the way, for this radio, if you happen to see the other video. My C+, plus, which is going to go to my A-, minus, or I can just hook it to the C+, plus here. Well, that's not a big deal. Okay, and then my B+, plus PR, my B plus 90, and this should be my A plus B minus. So my A plus B minus is going to go over here. My B plus power, I'm going to go ahead and hook that to 135 volts. And my B plus 90 is going to go to my 90 volts. I do need to hook my antenna wire to my A minus. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and turn this thing on first. And I've got a red light on the back of the unit. There you go. So, this is a Crosley 51, and I'm going to go ahead and hook this up because I want to show you a different configuration, and I want to explain something about the RB website. There are some wiring diagrams on the website and one of those diagrams is for a Crosley 51. Now the reason why those are there is to give you an idea of some different battery configurations and how it all ties in with the power supply which is a great thing but if you're going to use those diagrams be very aware of how your radio works. The Crosley 51 is a little bit unique in that it allows you to use different tube configurations. Now one of the tube configurations is by adding a power tube to the second tube in here, which would go in this slot. Now if you use the power tube, you're going to need a C- minus voltage, only if you use the power tube. And in order to use the C- minus voltage, you, there is a jumper between the C- and the A- internal to the radio that has to be desoldered. If you don't do that, what's going to happen is you're going to hook your C- up, you're going to hook your A- up, and basically what's going to happen is you're going to wind up with a short between your C- and your A- because your A- is hooked to your C- here. So, 
that will definitely short out the seat power supply. So you don't want to do that unless you have that jumper removed and you are using a power tube. If you're just using standard tube configuration, which is what I've got here, then you do not use the C-. So, with all that being said, let's go ahead and hook this thing up. I've got a... My A+, plus is going to go to my A+, plus, obviously. I do have my antennas hooked up, and I do have my uh, speaker hooked up here. Okay, there's my A+. Plus. And here is my A minus. And this is a plus 22 volts. Two oh one A tube. For my second tube, I'm going to hook it to the B plus 45, which is the same as a speaker jack. Now it's probably going to fall off here in a second, but all right. So that hooked up. Let me go ahead and set these off to the side here. There we go. All right. Powered up. Red light lit. See, that sounds pretty good. So I think uh, we've done a pretty thorough review of this battery eliminator and uh, I just wanted to finish up with some of the uh, discussion about cost. Now in several of the antique radio forums that I'm in that seems to always come up with the RB battery eliminator and it's funny because on one of the threads one of the guys had mentioned that the Antique Wireless Association sells a circuit card that actually um, will allow you to build a power supply and you just need to populate it and, and go ahead and uh, create your own power supply. Now that particular board cost thirty eight dollars now let me let me run down some costs here that board runs thirty eight bucks uh, the Hammond uh, 18324 transformer that you need for one of the power supplies is fifteen dollars uh, the 183k16 which is about twenty six bucks there's a triad VPS 230-110 that's about twenty five dollars you're going to need a power cord. Now it's going to be about five bucks for a power cord at least. Uh, definitely need a terminal strip uh, and a project box. So you're talking 15 for a terminal strip. At least 20 to 30 dollars for the project box. You're going to need some heat sinks. Those are going to be about five bucks a piece. And already with all those totaled up, you're hitting 160 dollars, which is the price you will pay for this right here. That does not include all the shipping that you're going to have to pay. It does not include things like heat sink compound and hardware, not to mention all the components that you need to populate the board if you don't have them in your project stashes. So I still think that this is a better deal because you also have to put in the time and effort to build it. Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing because like me, uh, I do like to build things. I like to create my own power supplies and stuff like that. So, yes, I, I have no problems doing that. I did that with the antique electrical supply, power supplies, and totally enjoyed doing that. So, 
this is just a matter of the money that you're going to pay for this battery eliminator is not unreasonable at all. It's a very good deal, especially since on top of you not having to build it and not having to come up with all these components, you still have a tried and true design. You have a circuit protection built into it and you have a five-year warranty and it's American-made and you're supporting a small business so you know the, the the pluses just keep going on and not to mention I love the look of the new case now granted that's an extra fifty dollars you don't have to spend that but you know hey if you got the money, why not? It, it, it's a nice little uh, addition to it, and I think it really sets this thing off. And, of course, you could also build your own case for that as well. So those are options that are available. So that is my review of this battery eliminator. I absolutely love it. I am going to get a lot of use out of it. And so far, just about everybody I know that has ever had one of these has nothing but good things to say about them. So... Great product. I'm not going to complain about it at all, and uh, I hope other people give it a shot. So, I hope you enjoyed today's video. This concludes this review, and I hope to see you again next video. Happy restorations, everybody. Goodbye.